it's really needful. It's really needful uh, as men come to our church. We have uh, a missionary just nearly one a week. The last six weeks we've had about eight missionaries in our church. We do that all the time. We prayed for years and years that God would uh, call some men into the fields uh, of harvest, and so God answered our prayer. Some preachers tell me, said, don't you get tired of preachers, uh, missionaries calling you? Certainly not. That's answered our prayer. We prayed for 30 years that God would call me, and He's called them. And I'm glad when they come back. I wouldn't want to get mad at God because He answered my prayer. It's like a woman having twins, you know. They never seen one knock one in the head and said, I just wanted one. Amen? Amen. All right. But I thank God what Brother Tom said. And there are some real, uh, if you leave here, if you leave here with a chip on your shoulder and what have you, I, I've had them just drive on the parking lot, drain their motor and what have you. Just There's a big oil spot. And every time I walked by there, I said, Jack so-and-so done that. Amen. I'll remind me, never send him a quarter. You know, amen. Amen. All right. Now, I'm glad. And I was glad to be here this week. And um, I thought many times I was over in a mission field, three missionaries argued. Three real good men. Godly men love the Lord. They said, what's our problem? I said, well, your problem is that only turkeys run around in herds. Eagles, they soar alone. So go find your place and get in a fight. Amen? On a bunch of like a bunch of turkeys, a bunch of chickens. Amen? All a turkey do is gobble and a chicken crow and lay an egg. So, you know... So if you want to be an eagle for God, you're going to have to soar alone. A lot of people will never, never serve God because they cannot stand the lonely life of a Christian. Amen. It's good tonight. Brother, Brother Sam used to be a member of this church. Sam Cravat. His wife was baptized here in this church. Brother Sam's here. He's head of our boys. Only come through here today. He's uh, fixing a preacher's home down here in Florida. But Sam, stand up, and the boys are with him. All you boys stand up there, boys. They, here they are. These are boys out of our boys' home, preacher. And we thank God for these boys. God bless you. Just a bunch of old renegades that Sam's led to God. And uh, so you you pray for the home. God give it to us seven, eight years ago. We bought it. And, uh, and uh, tonight uh, I was in a hospital in San Antonio, Texas, here a while back. A couple of years, maybe a year and a half ago, a year ago, or something. And, and as I went in this hospital uh, to visit this missionary who looked like us, he was going to die. He had led a Catholic lady to the Lord. He's been on the mission field over 20 years, 22, 23 years. And as uh, I went there to see this man, a, a doctor in Mexico had poisoned this man. And he just gave him a little poison every time he went to see the doctor. And, and that doctor has been put out of the country of Mexico. They exiled him uh, for what he did to this missionary. But uh, this missionary had been a friend of mine for many, many years. But so Danny Farley here, he supports him. And uh, this man today is crippled. And uh, what happened? He was laying in that hospital, and uh, he'd give him some French poison. And I, I looked at this old uh, ex-Green Beret, and uh, just tough as a boot, and uh, uh, battle scars all over him where he's fought the battle of the Lord. And... Uh, I was in his hospital, and I walked downstairs and gave me something to drink. And I went in there and looked up at the name of the hospital. It was the Artie Murphy Hospital. I said, well, that's a, that's a coincidence, isn't it? That this, this, uh, this, uh, this guy here, his name's Hawk, but he's really an eagle. And he soared alone. There's some people went down and tried to work with him, but like I say, turkeys running herds. You can't work with them. You, you just can't work with them. Amen? You just can't work with them. Ain't nobody can work with me. I don't want them to work with me. Go off somewhere. Leave me alone. Amen? That's right. That's right. They can't work with me. They said, I'm too hard. I am. I'm hard. We had a roll call here tonight. All the students said, here, here. How many teachers here? Raise your hand. Don't do it. God bless you. Okay? Amen. But, uh, you know, people say, you're hard. You're hard. Amen? 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 I, 
uh, student and faculty meeting, I want to say this. Amen. All right. All right. Amen. <clears throat> what's, what's good for the students, good for everybody else. All right. If you got your Bible, now turn in First Timothy, chapter six. First Timothy, chapter six. First Timothy, chapter six, and verse eleven. But thou. O man of God, I I believe in my heart that when I was first saved, that I had the privilege to work with a man of God. And what a privilege it was. I watched that old man of God when the denomination put him out. I watched old Lester roll off when the brethren turned their backs on him. Man who'd been to the college and the seminary, and George W. Truett predicted he'd be one of the great preachers, and he'd even preached in his church. But he said, Oh, thou man of God. I've been with that old man when he'd fast 15 and 20 days, trying to get a hold of God for what God wanted him to do. And I see some first class jerk say, You know what I think you ought to do? Let me tell you something, squirrel. You ain't going to tell God's man. I can take four hickory nuts and put them in a penny candy sack and run some of y'all to death. Amen? All right. All right. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness and godliness and faith Love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. One that I have called and has professed a good profession before many women. You have professed a good profession. And I never have done this, and this is the first time I've ever done it. But I'm going to do it. I was in that hospital the other day, and, uh, or a year ago, and I went through that hospital and I looked at uh, Audie Murphy's, uh, it was his hospital, it was named after him. It's one of the biggest hospitals in San Antonio. And uh, I saw all of the things he had as a child and what have you. And I said to myself, I said to myself, this man must have been a great man. But probably the movie. Uh, would uh, hinder this message tonight, you think about the man. But I want to make an application tonight, and I've never preached this, but I'd like to preach it tonight. Artie Murphy was uh, the most decorated soldier in World War II. The, he was cited by all of our allies as a great soldier. They gave him 23 citations for bravery. As I went through that little museum down in the bottom of that hospital there in San Antonio, I said, man, let me get to a library and get some books and read about him. When I went to the library and began to try to check out a book, and everyone in Houston, Texas, there wasn't one book on Artie Murphy. And I said, my soul, here's the most decorated Soldier in World War II fighting for our country. And uh, we got one about Martin Luther King. I celebrate the day to kill him. And I'm praying for Earl Ray. Did he escape? Yeah, he, it's up. 
I'll give him the gun if he'll escape. <laughs> fight the good fight of faith. Now begin to read about this man. And this young man, just a kid during World War II, and really not old enough to, to fight in the battle. And his daddy was a drunkard and been deserted as a child, and nobody wanted uh, anything to do with the family. This little orphan boy went down and enlisted in the army. And they said, why, you're not big enough. I will tell you tonight, God only uses men who are not big enough. And God will make you as big as God wants you. He said to a man of God, when thou was little in thy own eyes, God used you. Talking about you washing your car. I was out in Mexico the other day and pulled up there and was going to teach some, teach some young preachers. I walked outside and four of them had a rag wiping my car and washing my car. I said, if I'd been in America, then I had a Bible. Oh, I said, hey, man, what do you believe about them angels? And the reason God uses some of them boys down in Mexico, and there was a boy graduating right here. And he's a great big man, a good man, a godly boy. And he said to me here a while back, he said, why? And he was mad. And he's on the mission field, and I had him there. And I knew God wanted him there. He said, why does God use that boy 23 years old who don't know the Bible, don't know nothing about the Bible? Why does God use him and he don't use me? I said, because you think you're usable. And that Mexican knows he ain't. That Mexican's out there washing my car. And you're telling me how to drive it. I woke up in the morning. That Mexican had my boots shot in my boots. You said, that won't help. Listen, B.H. Cow one morning was sitting on the back steps. George W. Truett lived in the house with him when he was a young preacher. And he walked up to B.H. Cowell and said, What in the world are you doing? And he was shining in an old pair of boots, wore out. He said, I'm washing the feet of the saints. He said, What are you talking about? He said, You see that poor horse right there? You see that old raggedy buggy right there? He said, In the middle of the night while you was asleep, a man come out of that frontier out there in Texas, way back there. And said, he'd come in here last night. And he said, I sneaked in there and got his shoes. And I was washing them and cleaning them up and shining them because he's a man of God. I, these young punks walk up to me and hey, Jack, what do you believe about so and so? I want to say that. <laughs> Glory to God. He was, he was too little for the battle. When you turned him down to the Marine Corps, he weighed 100 pounds. His man who weighed 100 pounds wanted to get in the battle. Yeah. Weighed 100 pounds, he wanted to get in the battle. Nowadays they weigh 200 pounds, they want to get in the ministry. Ugh. My soul. This boy just kept. I I I I got. I, I found a book somewhere, an old second-hand book in a second-hand bookstore, and I read it. Right, and he said, "Boy, they turned him down and turned him down." He just kept trying to find a place to fight for his country. And I said, "My God, if we could charge some up, Amen." I mean, he just he just went back there. And they said, "Doctor Robin," he just he just began to eat and gorge himself and gorge himself. And just go out and, and he said, in 90 days he went in there and, and his stomach was swelled up. He drank all the water he could hold and he just barely passed 116 pounds. This is the greatest soldier we had. <laughs> he said, I don't care what you believe, I'm trying to preach to you tonight. You see, he finally just got in. And that's what you need tonight. 
You need to just give in. Just give in. And then I want you to notice something if you please. He made preparation to be a good soldier, to fight that good fight of faith. And I, I, I just went and read that book and it told about how this boy never handled a gun in his life, knew nothing about it. But nowadays, bless God, when a man wants to learn how to build a bridge, it takes him about seven, eight years. And they call him some kind of an engineer. I know nothing about it. If he wants to be a medical doctor, it takes him about, I don't know, eight or ten years. But uh, when he gets called to preach, and he leaves his hometown and comes here, when he walks in the door, he knows it all. Just ask him if you don't believe it. I mean, it takes Dr. Rutman a year to knock you out where he can fill you up. Now, I'm going, I'm going to surprise you with something. We, we got, we had two young men got saved in Houston. My son, John, led both those boys to the Lord. That has always been saved five years. He's in Spain tonight. He's been there about eight or nine months doing a good job. But you said, well, he's just been saved five, just saved five years. Yeah, just saved five years. But you see, five years before that, as a 17-year-old boy, his daddy died, he worked and fed his mother, brought his check home every Saturday night and handed it all to her. You see, he is a man. And where you was getting some from daddy, and still writing them letters now to get some more, God help you. You say, I wish my mother and daddy quit telling me what to do. Well, quit writing for money. I, I said, I said, Eleazar and his brother Jesus, when they got saved, we had a bunch of young people in the back. They just walked right on by. And they, uh, I said, now, you need to sit down here in the front, boys. Then they begin to get them a, a, They never would wear boots. They wore shoes. But they got them a tie. White shirt, got him a suit of peace, so a front row. And the first persecution they ever got, they got it from the teenagers in a Baptist church. <laughs> and you know those two boys, God. The other one, the baby boy now is about twenty. Boy, he's done got he's done about three years of Bible. And he graduated the top boy. 360 students in Houston, and, and they said, we want to send you to school, give you some kind of a deal where you can go to college or study to be a doctor. He said, God has called me to Spain. No time to go over there. What are you talking about, preacher? Come back on the front seat. Got my tie. I said, preacher, he's sitting there listening. Jesus walked up and said, can I get you a drink of water? He went back and get my water. Huh? I got some other boy around. How you doing, old man? And they still are. They've been there a long time. My daddy used to say all the time, man, how much is I suppose I said three dollars a bush, at least I'll be back. Papa said we can't live on them be backs. Huh? And that's just a lot of folks just be back all the time. The Lord has called me to do so and so. And six months later, they'd be back. I'm going to get on with my little story about my Artie Murphy. He didn't have any education. He didn't have any preparation. He didn't have any good association. He knew nothing about warfare. But he sure did train quick. He was tried and he was trained. Listen, he first he got in the training camp. Second, he got on that foreign country. And before you know it, he got him a little small command. And the battle broke loose. And the battle started. I remember the first church God gave me. It wasn't but twelve of them and three devils. I didn't feed the first twelve very much, but I sure give them, them three devils hell. I tell you that much. I gave it to them. I mean, I practiced on them. I mean, I knew I was going to the city of Houston. I practiced. I, and boy, I remember 1957, we pulled into Houston, and boy, they said, 
Oh, Jack Jones. And the Southern Baptists took me in. They loved me and said, this boy was such a testimony. And, uh, and uh, oh, here they were. Uh, 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 and when you get real nice to me, I'm watching you. We put the tin up. We preached 61 days. And that disturbed them. Just preached 61 days. I've still got it wrote down in a diary. 68 grown people were baptized in 1957, and underneath that tent, we baptized them people. Here come the ministerial alliance. They drove up and said, Reverend Wood, I knew something was up. He said, the, the West End Baptist wants to take this tent down. You see, the battle was on. What the kind of battle all the Murphy's in? The suck eyes in, honey, was real. I want you to go downtown. We're going to buy you a new shirt. I needed it. I didn't preach some others out of Thirty-something years ago, I waved goodbye to those people. I ain't never even preached. I think I've preached in either one or two of their churches in the last 31 years. Then I went over there, and I, I was so green, if you'd have planted me, I'd have grew. I went over there, and that was the World Baptist. And I didn't know who they were, but boy, I said, man, they love God. Old brother John Duckett and those men. I went in there and those old men loved God. Boy, and I began to meet with them. I told my wife, I said, man, I found some people love God. And then I, what, they said, there's another crowd over here, independent. And I went over there. And, 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 and I had a little visit with them. They didn't ask me to preach, but I had a little visit with them. And, and somebody said something, and I waved my hand. And they said, are you a Pentecostal? And I said, what's that? That's green, man. Green! And they said, we're from Springfield. I said, where's that? I, God's honest before God. I don't know what they're even talking about. And I said, Did you, have you ever met that brother Duckett? He's a fine old man. We don't speak to him. I said, my soul. And so then I went back over the next week to his church, and a guy in there told me, he said, if you go over there, don't come over here. I said, go to hell and walk out. <laughs> Nobody tell me what to do. Hey, the Southern Baptists are going to pay me a salary. And if I'm going to do something for nothing, let them pay my salary. This crowd here ain't going to give me nothing. So I ain't never preaching in another church. Ain't that been a blessing? But you know what I told the Lord? I said, Lord, how come, how come Freddie Gage is way up high and I'm way down here? He says, well, you wrong. You ain't got no sense. So I stayed way down here. Them guys there is all roaming around up here under. And when they told me they was dead and ready to retire, man, I just got ready to go. They, they, all, they all hung it up. One of them went to penitentiary, just got out of Florida penitentiary. He's an evangelist. And that's the guy I want to be like him. Man, I'm glad God didn't let me be like him. I'd have me a number on my back. I'd be like him. God took me out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody ever heard of me. I ain't never preached over 40 people. I just go to this church, that church, this church. Ain't nobody knew me. Man, I had me a little horn up on top of my car. I'd preach and preach with sinners to get saved. Nobody knew me. And I didn't know nobody. And furthermore, the preachers that I met, I did it's all of them was like them. I didn't want to meet them. A guy said, "Come to our fellowship." Boy, and I'm gonna tell you something. Most of the things I've been to, uh, them there was cutting ships, man. There wasn't no fellowship. In. Amen. This boy here, he got him a little command. wasn't a big deal, just a little command. And I remember, I remember them rats overrunning my house in that first church. Now, when rats overrun your house, all you got to do is find three old cats, and they're everywhere. I hate cats. God knows. If any of y'all are cattle ever don't speak to me, I hate them. I hate them. I, I, I caught me three or four cats and turned them loose on the rats, and they wiped them out. One night, my wife, one morning, my wife handed me a, a, some toast, and I said, uh, if I have to eat this road for refined Hades, now his legs were sticking up. I mean, just, you know, I mean, dirt poor. 
Twenty dollars a week, whether we need it or not. Every week, twenty dollars a week. Everybody drove by a house and <laughs> we drove preach on the street. And when I walked up at the bartender said, Here comes the preacher. Plug in right that. I plug in right there. Here's your coke. I said, Thank you. That's the best friend I had in town. <laughs> on the bar. Yeah. I'm trying to tell you tonight, in this story about Artie Murphy, he prepared to be a good soldier. He went to the field. He was sent there by his commander. He didn't go off on his own. He didn't seek out the enemy by himself. Hey, the general told him where to go. And the general sought him where he went. Then he gave him the supplies to fight the battle. I won't just say this. He got shot. But he stayed. God knows I hate a quitter. I hate I hate a quitter. And I hate you if you're a quitter. You say you ain't supposed I had a dog, but he that dog he'd run a cow till he just got hot. And I always wore a pistol. All my life I ain't never went to bed without one, I ain't never got up with one. I sleep on one. I don't know why, I just makes me comfortable. <laughs> Anything makes you comfortable, help yourself. But I just told Lightning, I said, Lightning, go chase the cows. All the rest of the dogs were chasing the cows. And he'd run and look at me. And one day I just said, bye, Lightning, boom. <laughs> hey, he was born to run cows. His bloodline was a cow dog. And the only use I had for him was to run cows. And there's no one, no cows. Boom. Yeah. I want you to notice something here, please, about Artie Murphy. He was completely aware of who his enemy was. Now, some of you preacher boys, you think your wife is your enemy. And God knows some of them are. I, I'm, I'm going to say this again and again and again. And I, I ain't got no sympathy for a kitty baby. If y'all don't use that word, if y'all help yourself, but we use it in Texas, and that's all you are. I, I hate to see some man boot her up. <laughs> My wife, like I praise God, she's gone. Danny Farley, he, he looked at me one night. He was with me on a visitation. This guy was a little boy. My wife, my wife right off. And she'd been sleeping with four or five of the teenagers in the church. My wife left me. I said, my God, if a man could get rid of a dirty-legged trap like that, praise God, she's gone. Let's take him an offer and then give her some money where she gets the airplane and get far away. My soul. Maybe a truck will run over something. But this man, this boy knew who his enemy was. He knew the mark of that enemy. Hey, that enemy was all mark. He knew who they were. And he is out there killing his enemy. He wasn't shooting his own men. He wasn't walking out looking for the wounded to blow their brains out. Are you listening to me? He was out there killing the enemy. God calls you to fight a good fight. A man told me, he said, you're the most merciless man on the wild. That's right. On the, I have no mercy on an apostate. I ain't going to shake his hand. I've had to just walk up and how are you doing? I'm going to have my pocket. Amen. 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 There's a bunch of infidels that come out now. They told us what they are. He told one of his professors of North Carolina that he said, Do you believe he is the president? I can call his name. He's the president of the big denomination in North Carolina back then. And they said, Do you believe I was a, a virgin birth of Christ? He said, Some men feel led of the Lord. 
I've got it in a Baptist paper. I got it in their Baptist paper. And this man said, some people feel led of the Lord to believe in the virgin birth, and others don't feel led of the Lord, and it doesn't make them any less Christian whether they do or don't. They said, will you sign the statement that there was a man named Adam and a woman named Eve? He said, I believe that's very irrelevant to the case. No, I would not sign that. He said, that would put a harness on a man where you would hinder his education. Or you'd hinder him from being a worth more than he already is. This man completely knew who his enemy was. He knew the method of the enemy. He had this young man knew the mentality that he was fighting one of the smartest armies that ever went abreast. When this boy went to war, you said the life of this boy, Artie Murphy, and you'll find out that he knew that them Germans were some of the smartest soldiers in the world. And I'm here to tell you tonight that you're going out there to fight the devil, and he knows exactly wherever we place he is. Whether it be in you, in your children, in your home, in your family, in your power, the devil knows where the weak point is. And that's where he's coming. You mark that down tonight. I'm going to hurry. This young man abandoned his life for the destruction of the soul. His whole life was abandoned to destroy the enemy of the United States. And he had 264 certified kills. Boy told me he'd come back from Nam. He was my associate pastor. And he, tonight he's in Chile. He told me and Brother Danny Farley to tell an Indian boy in his Marine outfit he's in. He said, we take that boy. He said, he acted strange. And he said, when I left Vietnam, he said, he wouldn't leave. But said he had 64 certified kills. I mean, he brought their tag back. This man's a warrior. We're talking about a little 100 pound man who is not, as far as the world's concerned, he's not supposed to. As far as you're, the world's concerned, me and you ain't supposed to mount to nothing. First place, you're in the wrong school. And the second place, you're a fool. And the third place, you won't go according to their rules. Are you listening to me tonight? This young man abandoned his life for the destruction of the enemy. He made no provision for the flesh. I said that boy, if he endangered his life, that he was wounded time and time again, it just seemed like he didn't care. But one thing on his mind, that stopped the enemy. Before they come across that pond. Total abandonment to warfare. That's where we're failed tonight. We got a little church run a little over two hundred people down there on Sunday morning, probably three hundred preaching service. I called my wife last night, I believe she told me Sunday morning. Twenty eight hundred dollar missionary offering. I won't know how much mission offering. Every time I leave, I know how much mission offering. Because I'm gonna send that money. I'm gonna mail that money to Jim Ballard. I'm going to mail that money to Brian Stevens. And I'm going to mail that money to big old fat Linton Smith. You said he ain't going to do nothing. Yeah, his wife's going to wake him up and he's going to do something. <laughs> just some things you don't know. <laughs> just some things you don't know. You said, well, let me tell you what I think about. Whatever you think stinks, God knows. Amen. He's there and you ain't. Is that ever in your mind? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You said, I'll tell you what, I don't make no difference. Don't make no difference. You have been wrong. <laughs> he was totally abandoned to warfare. He was versed in the use of the weapons. Are you listening? You've got some weapons, buddy, that you ain't never brought out of the canvas yet. They're all, they're ready to go, and you ain't never even looked at them yet. And I'm going to tell you something. The greatest hindrance, the greatest hindrance is that prayer letter. Now, it could be a real blessing, as the brethren have already said, but that thing could be the curse of God. One man told me the other day, he said, I sent out 200 prayer letters. 
And he said, you know how many answers I got? I said, how many did you get? He said, one. I said, that means you missed God on those 199 you mailed them to. It cost 77 cents, I believe 78 cents, to mail a letter from Germany to America. So if you mail 200 and you paid 78 cents a piece, why didn't you take that $150 and pay it on your bill? Look like it made good sense to me. Then maybe, maybe the Holy Ghost said, touch somebody without you. Oh, you said, well, he needs my little letter. Wonder why he didn't use it. Yeah. He abandoned his life to the destruction of the enemy. But thou, man of God, flee these things. Fight the good fight of faith. And boy, this, this, the devil don't like us. They, they don't just like us to get up and say, this is what God wants. You know, the world can't stand it. said, let's have a business meeting. I, I mean, the world just can't. Brother Danny Farley took the East River Baptist Church years, seven years ago. And one man, he never came. And he, they said he was a member of that. About a year later, well, Danny was visiting. And this guy was sitting in his house just like this. He said, I, I might come back to your church. Danny, he'd been my associate for a while. And he'd made a few visits with me. And he ain't never been bashful either. He said, but what I want to know is when is the first business meeting? And Brother Farley said, never. <laughs> when is the first deacons meeting? Never. And that will be too soon. One guy said, can any good thing come out of Galilee? I've always said, could any good thing come out of a committee meeting? Amen. <laughs> this man here was a model to those who he led. He was a warrior and not a driver. He was a model to them. This man never drove nobody. And you know, young preacher, you get out there somewhere, and things ain't going like you think it's going, and you become a driver. I'm going to tell you, you can't drive a herd of cattle nowhere unless some cowboy gets in the front of a horse and a couple of dogs with him and leads those cattle and leads those cattle and the other men drive them off. Somebody has got to lead them. And the man leading them is in the most dangerous position if anything goes wrong. You got that tonight? You got that tonight? I said here, he was a model. You see, he had their welfare... On his mind all the time. When I read about him crossing that Rhine River, and I read about those Germans catching him over there, and blowing those tanks up, and killing all his men and everything, and he got up on that gun, and got that German gun, German tank that was blowed up, and got on that gun, and began to kill them Germans, and told those men to get back across that river, and watched every man he had. Listen, he wasn't a, he wasn't a driver. He was a leader. He had those men's welfare. This old man sitting up on his platform has got pure welfare on his mind. And if he didn't have, he'd be just like me. He'd have been long gone a long time ago. Man, I've had him get out now, I'll go run me off. I, 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 man, you name it, it's happened to me. You say, I don't understand that. That's right. What, what, you clean it up, man. It's happened. Man, Danny Father's out, he'd say, let's just get out now. I said, bless God, I'm going to whip you right now. Help yourself. You said, well, I'll just tell you, Brother Wood. If they're just going to have a fight and an argument at the church, I'm going to all go on home quit. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to be fighting when Jesus comes. Amen. This Bible said, fight! A good fight! Amen. And every church in this Bible, man, there was confusion, there was argument, there was heresy, there was everything in the church. You said, I was just looking for a perfect church. Don't join it. You're corrupted. This man never retreated until his men were saved. You study the life of David. He had 600 trained, tried, tested men. He took care of them. The 
at all times, even those who didn't go to battle. He made sure they got part of the money. Listen, David's men are listed in this Bible. Jesus' men are listed in this Bible. Paul's men are listed in this Bible. What are you saying, preacher? He gave credit to every man that helped him. He called that great warrior, Artie Murphy, and said, we want to put the Congressional Medal of Honor on you, and the President walked up there to put it on him. And they said, you got anything to say? And he said, sir, my men deserve the credit for what we've done. But nowadays, I'd like you to see the plant that I have built. When I came here, there was nothing. And I have resurrected this whole mess. You know what a mess is? A mess is a fellow sort of wild back had an elephant in his church for a big day. And it took seven wheelbars to wheelbar one movement out. That's a mess. On the carpet. That's a mess. I said Artie Murphy was a soldier. And you know, I, I don't understand this thing. It was so when I started. I'm glad that I didn't start when you did. I'm glad I started when I did. Because when I started, and you know, everybody likes to talk about the past, I'm just telling you God's truth. There just wasn't no suits, and there wasn't no shoes, and there wasn't no fine house, and there wasn't no car. Why, well, I, I just... But, uh, old Brother Earl, you said... He had been preaching nine years and said he'd come to Florida to preach revival me. He said, the only time I was ever late in my life, said I bought a car for $50. He had preached nine years and didn't have a car. He told me one day we was preaching in North Carolina, and he said, Pass the hat. We're right in the middle of the street. And I said, Oh, we tell you, you ain't going to pass my hat. Somebody will keep it. He said, You better pass that hat, or we're going to walk to the next town. Preaching on the street. So I passed the hat and had three half a dollar. He said, well, that ain't much. So whole of them ain't got nothing. And a dollar was in by five gallons of gas. And we bought two Coca-Cola and away we went. I mean, man, we, we had good sense. Some tough times and crying times and lean times ain't going to hurt you. A lady came to Houston the other day and Come down and go to work, her husband did, and she said, uh, What is all these little bugs on the floor? I said, Roaches. <laughs> she said, My God, they're everywhere. <laughs> she reached up and got her box of cereal, and I said, Count them. <laughs> oh, she said, I, I just don't believe I can handle it. I said, You better go home now. Because they'll get worse. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. I've seen people quit because of roaches. I've seen people quit because of rats. But I read Adolf Hitler's life, and he said he sat down and took a rat, hung him over the fire on his bayonet, and ate him. I read that and told him, look, World War I. In other words, he had him a fried rat. We said, I wouldn't do that. I know he became the leader of the world. God hadn't stopped him, he would have led the world. A demon possessed man was willing to do anything, and some of God's people are willing to do nothing. Lord, I'll go where you want me to go, and I'll stay as long as it's good pay. And I don't have any bad days. I wonder if Artie Murphy and him. With bullet holes all through them and the blood running down in their socks, wading through the mud and nothing to eat, in a cold, cold foreign land, would have just said, Well, flip it, man, let somebody else do it. And to throw them guns down, and you and I would be speaking German today. (laughs) 
You better give credit where credit's due. He gave credit to those who helped him. I want to give you this last thing, please. He was rewarded by his countrymen. Twenty-six medals, they all hang there in San Antonio, Texas. He's not the only hero ever come out of San Antonio, Texas. We have a town named Houston after a great general, Sam Houston. We have Travis County named after Colonel Travis. We have Bowie, Texas, named after Bowie himself. You see, those men built a country because there's men. They don't know about your sisters. There's men. God knows there's men. Man, I, I, you know, I just, that, I just relate to them guys, you know. Bowie, he's laying there, and he said, drag me over. I'm going to fight. He got him two guns in his hand. Got that Bowie knife. And they said, when he got in there to him, there's six, seven of them laying dead over him. Now, that, 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 I just, I like that. I like that. But I wish I had a picture of it. I'd hang it up on the front of my house. I sat and look at it. Nowadays in the ministry, the only thing you get a picture of is their back while they're running. And you ask them what they're running from. And they said, my wife was going to have a baby. And she couldn't even speak Chinese. Well, look, why don't that stupid thing learn? Hey, bro, why don't you learn? I mean, Hudson Taylor and him got on a boat. and got, It took them six months to get there. And when the people stepped off the boat, they could speak the language. Eight, nine, ten hours a day. They studied the language. Hey, a woman came to me the other day, 31 years in a foreign country, and she couldn't speak one word. Pure, slow-down laziness. I mean, just, I mean, lies are just falling off of some of God's people and are dead. Your wife won't live on a dead man. And he, just, he just crawls off some people. They're dead, man. They're dead. Dear Lord, please send me something to eat. What for? You don't need nothing to eat. You ain't going to do nothing. I got to thinking, I think. How, how much does uh, the average man here make? Seven and a half, eight dollars an hour? <laughs> Six dollars an hour? Five dollars an hour? Five dollars an hour, okay. You make five dollars an hour. You work forty hours a week. You make two hundred dollars a week. You go to school. You feed your family. You make five dollars an hour. And that means if this church supports a missionary in a foreign land, we're going to say this young man here gives ten dollars a week to missions. That's two hours. This one gives 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 two hours. So finally we get 20 young men to support one missionary. And he goes away and works three hours a week. So what he's telling us is he's worth $100 an hour. Oh, you must be brilliant. I got to thinking about that tough day. I got a man, comes to my church. I've never met his wife. I've never seen her. She don't want to see any preacher. She don't want to come in his house. And this man puts a check for five hundred dollars every Sunday in the mission office. He's not a rich man, but he just gives it all. And I've got some men give two or three hundred dollars a week. If a man has to work forty or fifty hours to get that three hundred dollars. The missionary that takes that money owes 50 hours to that man. And as stupid as some missionary years that I know, they owe 65 because they couldn't make it with $3 dollars hour. You say, now, I don't like you, brother, because you're a criticized missionary. This year, I'm praying about giving $150,000 this year to missions. My wife told me the first four months, December, January, February, March, we gave $40,000. She mailed the checks out. 40000 So I'm for you, missionary. But you lazy bum, I ain't for you. And if you go to the field, you owe that church 
And you're not a welfare recipient. You're not a welfare. You're not on welfare. You're not on welfare. You're not on welfare. You're not on welfare. You owe a day's work for what you got. Man, come to me one day and he said, Brother Wood, I prayed. And God, I've been trying to live my faith and trust the Lord. And I said, well, how many hours have you been out knocking on doors? He said, well, this week? I said, yeah. He said, I, I knocked on doors about six or seven hours. I said, well, how much you get in? He said, I can give it $21 is all I got in. I said, three dollars out. That's more than you were. I said, it's more than you were. Well, I don't think you're supposed to figure it like that, brother. How are you supposed to figure it? If it won't work, don't let them eat. I believe that means if it don't work, don't support them. I mean, why send Artie Murphy to Germany to fight if he ain't going to kill Germans? What did he get them decorations for? Shooting Germans. What are you going to get decorations for? Winning Germans. Winning Irishmen. Winning Chinamen. Winning Mexicans. That's all you're going to get away from. Wow! Is what you've done. He got 26 medals. Come to his hometown. They put a statue up. Honored him in his hometown. You can go down the state of Texas and see on the freeway that said, Artie Murphy Boulevard. And everybody says, Martin Luther King, I want to spray it and write on it, Artie Murphy. Yeah. There's hospitals named Artie Murphy Hospital. There's streets named Artie Murphy Hospital Street. There's museums named after that man. Now the question is, what's going to be after your name? And I'm going to tell you something, young man. About every eight years, all the preachers I know, I take a picture and I hang it up. And about every eight years, I look back over that thing for a warning from my own soul. And I look back and after eight or nine years... I said, that man's gone, that man fell, that man quit, and that man got out, and this old boy's still gone. Hmm? What's going to be after your name? You're going to leave a monument. I'm going to close. Dr. Billy Kanoi has been a friend of mine for years. Dr. Billy Kanoi was up preaching. Something happened 20-something years ago. He was at Sammy Allen's camp meeting. He was up preaching, teaching. And he said, this wicked preacher, he said, he ran off and left his family, ran off with a piano player and done this, that, and nothing. He told all about it. Service was over. Beautiful young lady and her husband and baby came following. She said, Dr. Kenoy, I wish you'd promised me today you'd never use that illustration again. He said, that man was my daddy. And Dr. Kenoy started crying, big old ugly bald-headed thing started crying and he said, girl, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'll never use that illustration again. But that man had left a street named after him. He could name it Fallen One. Artie Murphy came home. They played the bands in Dallas. One of our little town of Farmersville, Texas, where he was born. The town, little old orphan boy, nobody didn't speak to him, but now they give him the key to the city. And one day, me and you going to step over to the other side. God's going to give us the key to the city. Nobody here might not ever recognize us, but we're headed to a better country. Let's pray. Let's pray. I wonder tonight, maybe some of you before pianos ever played or anything, you need to just fall in the altar. And I, I know tonight I... I don't know, it just seemed like God just dealt with me all day. This is it. This is it. And uh, Brother Homer said, you just preach to them. We're going to teach on missions and what young men all do. Brother Wood, you just preach to them. And young men, I didn't come here to hurt nobody. I didn't come here, I didn't come here, lady, to hurt you. I come here to help you. But oh my God, today, young preachers, young preachers, did you hear him calling that roll a while ago? They said that one quit. That one's gone, Dr. Ruckman. That one's falling out. There's going to be another roll call. Seven, eight years later, some men will be standing right here in this thing. They say, you remember so-and-so? Yeah, he's gone. You remember so-and-so? Yeah, they're through. You remember so-and-so? Hey, Danny Farley's my son-in-law. More than anything. I don't care what happens. God knows. I don't care what happens. But he's got a wife, my oldest, one of my oldest girls. 
about 36 years old, I guess. 35. I hate for somebody to call her and tell her this old man done went down, fell into sin, he's gone. The pride and the joy of my life weep over an old fallen daddy. Listen, I, I, I stood because I, I do. I love the Lord. I don't want to tell you something. God gave me a precious family. He gave me some precious children. And I'll tell you, the devil's knocked on my door many a time. I could have quit. I could have got out. I could have done this and that and the other. I could have took a shortcut. But I said, them children looking at me. These young preacher boys are looking at me. This church is looking at me. My critics, are, listen, if for no other reason, I won't live my critics. They hate me. They despise me. They spit when they miss. I just won't live for God to the end just because of them. When I get to the end, wave goodbye and say, boys, I made it. I live like God wants me to live. Why don't you just come on down tonight, fall on the altar and say, here I am, Lord. Lord, you could use me. Lord, I'm ready to sacrifice. Lord, I don't have to have the best things in life. Lord, listen, there's some men here that are wealthy and, and you've, you've got some good things. I, I thank God for you. May God bless you with it. May you. But some of you just, God didn't intend that for you. God didn't intend that. God, you're just an old poor boy like me. God didn't intend that for you. Just take what's yours. Serve God. He'll bless you for it. Father, you see these on their knees here tonight. You see these that need to get on their knees. Lord God, you see that woman, that man, is living so close to the edge. God, I pray tonight they just come home and fall in order and say, Lord, here I am. God, use me for the glory of God. Get me off the edge. Get me close to the heel side. In Jesus' name, amen.